Hi, and welcome back to thattutorguy.com. Today I'm going to be talking about memorizing the unit circle. By the way, if you need a good chart to look at, on my website in multiple places, I have a uh, black and white version of this thing in PDF that you could download your computer so you can use it there or print it out real easily. So if that's helpful, go for it. So trick number one, all students take calculus. I've been surprised over the years. I actually learned this from a student many years ago, and I've been surprised at how many other students did not know this already. The deal is that in the four quadrants, it's very hard to talk and write, in the four quadrants, which are one, two, three, and four, the sine and cosine might be positive or negative depending which quadrant we're in, right? So the all students take calculus tells you which one of the trig functions are positive. What happens is that in most of the quadrants, two, three, and four, most things are negative. So you'll have two negatives and one positive out of sine, cosine, and tangent. So the S in, in students stands for sine, meaning that the sine is the positive one in that quadrant, and the other two are negative. So cosine and tangent are negative. Take stands for tangent, which means that tangent is the positive one, and sine and cosine are both negative. And then uh, C stands for cosine, means that cosine is positive, but sine and tangent are both negative. And then all actually stands for all, meaning all three are positive, which makes sense because both x and y are positive in this quadrant. So this is a little mnemonic device that seems really helpful for a lot of people. Other kids I've found really like the stack of pluses and minuses. Like for some reason they can just sort of visually look at that and just memorize it. And that's great if you can do that. Uh, whatever technique gets you through the day, you know what I mean? Just want to throw a few at you. And then, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, and then the other thing is, well, if you know that cosine and sine are just the x and y coordinates, you can just figure it out, you know, freshly for yourself each time. Because if you're in the first quadrant, you can kind of look at it and say, oh, my x value would be positive, and my y would be positive. In the third quadrant, both x and y are negative, therefore sine and cosine are both negative. You know, that kind of thing. This one's super self-explanatory. Never really met a student who had trouble, much trouble with the compass points compared to other angles, but there you go, zero and one. Um, what does get tricky for these four points are that some of the other functions, it's so like tangent is undefined some places, right? Because sine, tangent is sine over cosine. And therefore, if cosine is zero, that means that tangent is undefined whenever cosine is zero. So up here, and down here, cosine is zero, therefore tangent's undefined. Similar things happen for secant, cosecant, and cotangent at various compass points. So I talk a lot more about that in a video on my website, but the point is you wanna be really careful with undefined. Remember, one over zero is undefined, or sometimes you write it infinity, but really the right answer is undefined. Whereas zero over one is just zero, it's no big deal. All right, this is a big trick that no one seems to notice until I should point it out, but if the last number in the angle, you know, in the degree angle is five, then both sine and cosine are square root of two over two. And that's because if you have a five in, as the last digit, that means your reference angle must be 45. But of course, 45 degrees has both a sine and cosine a square root of two over two. So that means that your sine and cosine of any angle that ends in a five is gonna be either plus or minus square root of two over two. That's super helpful information, obviously. And the same can be said of the denominator. If, um, if the denominator is four for any of these things, then that means that you must have a sine and cosine of square root of two over two. Similar thing for radians in general, if six is the denominator, your reference angle is 30. And if three is your denominator, your reference angle is 60. Over two, most people seem to already realize, it's gonna be a reference angle of 90 degrees, meaning you're either straight up or straight down. And last tip, if you're not, these are, tend to be the trickiest ones. The ones that are not 45 degree angles, where you have to decide whether it's a 30 or a 60. So for example, in the first quadrant here, 60 and 30, they both are a combination of square root of three over two and one half, right? It's just that in one, they just switch order. And that's true all the way around the unit circle we have these pairs of points which have the same coordinates, they're just switched. 
And that is why they are confusing. But here's the trick to remember. Square root of 3 over 2 is bigger than 1 half. Because square, uh, square root of 3 over 2 is like 0 0.86, 0 0.866 or something. And that's bigger than 1 half by quite a bit. So if you just look at a point, you can estimate whether you think the x or y coordinate is bigger. So for example, at 30 degrees, it looks like the x coordinate would be bigger. And sure enough, it is. So that means that the cosine of 30 must be the square root of 3 over 2. But if you look at 60 degrees, we're now much closer to the y-axis than the x-axis. So our y-coordinate's bigger, which means it's the sine of 60 that is square root of 3 over 2. And the other one, of course, is 1 half. Once you know that, you can go all the way around the circle doing the same thing. And then, of course, just put in your pluses and minuses based on all student state calculus. Um, another pattern you'll notice is that, let's, like, let's say we look at the one where the square root of 3 over 2 is the x-coordinate. There's four like that. And there, it's basically all the angles that have a reference angle of 30 degrees. If you don't know what reference angles are, check out the website or look it up on the web. But you'll notice that these four angles, they actually form a really nice pattern here. They're all across x. You know, they're all reflections across x or y of each other. And they also form what I consider a pretty good bow tie. So check that out. So I would call these, the, I call these the bow tie angles. And I'll have another video that makes more use of that and shows how useful it can be. But the point is that because they form a bow tie, you know that the four coordinates that are sort of all in the same, all identical, are going to go across from each other and form a perfect bow tie. Same thing happens at 45 degrees. The square root of 2 over 2s, if you sort of colored in those triangles, you would get another bow tie. I would call that the 45 degree bow tie. And then lastly, the 60 degree. So I'll get in, into that in another video. Uh, while you're at it, be sure to check out my website. Print out a nice unit circle for yourself and your friends. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.